Welcome back. Welcome back to the Detroit is Different podcast studios. And I am here continuing this journey. Y'all already know my first love is hip hop. So I have somebody that is grounded in Detroit hip hop for sure. And carrying on, y'all going to see a lot more of these people that grab the mic and do what they do with rhymes, patterns together and freestyles and flows and production and scratching and so much more. I have the brother P Groove in effect. P Groove, how you feeling? Well, thank you for having me. Yes, All sir. Right. Yes, sir. It's been like uh, a minute. Like I told you, I was like, yo, I would love to get you in studio because you've been in so many studios and know a lot about that Detroit story in hip hop from, sure. you know, you just touched a little bit from the inner sea and, and working with so many acts of that origin of a lot of hip hop. We thinking like uh, early 90s on in Detroit. Yeah, I came up in, well, a little bit before the Rhythm mm -hmm. Kitchen era, mm -hmm. uh, the hip-hop shop, the um, Mahogany, you know, the 1515 Broadway, uh, that kind of era was uh, where, you know, we get like um, the D12s, Eminem, Slum Village, the LZI. Um, even before the end, though, uh, with Jack Frost, uh, Detroit's Most Wanted, um, the Chip Ahoy, mm -hmm. Bro, you remember them? Nah, man, but Nikki D, uh, we've been doing some of these interviews. We did a series, Myself is We, me and Sterling Toes, Detroit is Different Family, most definitely, where we study the, like, uh, like a journey of some of the hip-hop history of Detroit, and that was really fun. And a lot of y'all music came up in the mix of this. Yeah. And the production. Yeah. So, uh, let's start a little bit there. Hip hop. Mm -hmm. How, what was what was that like? Uh, just forming the group. Well, it was um, like a, a thing that started with me and my partner in um, high school. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Um, we got into a group, and then uh, we like wanted to get a DJ, and uh, I was cool with DJ Los, and DJ Los introduced us to uh, DJ Dez. Hmm. And then when we met Dez, he was so dynamic that, I mean, at the time it was, uh, the group was called P Groove and Sleepy D. Hmm. And then when we met Dez, it was like, this guy is crazy, so we need to have a group name because just being P Groove and Sleepy D, you know, that, that they was- They honoring the DJ. Yeah, and not only was he not just a DJ, he was a producer. He was he can also rap. You know, Dez is like, you know, Dez is the embodiment of hip hop as well. Mm -hmm. Like graffiti, you know, I think he probably even was breakdancing at one point in time, you know what I mean? But he like, you know, know how to play uh percussions. He's like, you know, a classically, you know, I mean not classically trained, but you know uh, well, one hell of a percussionist. Yeah, how how would you I would say like one hell of a percussionist. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? saying. It's like if 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 you got levels of it, like he don't mm -hmm. he don't play. Yeah, like play around. Like, yeah, he don't like tinker it's not with jam it. session. He don't tinker mm -hmm. with it. It's like he really can like do those rhythms. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Like he got the whole theory with hand movements and stuff like that. Stuff that you don't even think about when you just playing a drum. Okay, you know what I mean? But yeah, he's he was great. So we just. Decided to come up with a, a group name, and then that's when we came up with the Inner Circle, and it became the Inner C. All right, so now that you gave that introduction, we're going to do the classic Detroit is different. Y'all family origins, how far deep is your people to the city of Detroit? You first, second, third generation Detroit? Um, I am, I think I'm first generation Detroit. Okay. Where about y'all yeah, people? My people came from uh, Alabama. Whereabouts? Close to the Gulf. It's mm. uh, Monroeville, Alabama. Monroeville, Alabama, close to the Gulf Coast, man. So that's from the bottom on up. What yeah, they up? they made they made um, a book called "The Kill the Mockingbird." That was like a classic book that was mm -hmm. written in Monroeville. It was it was an author in Monroeville that actually wrote that book. Mm. Yeah, we had to read that in ninth grade. <laughs> yeah, so that was, you know what I'm saying, one of those things that um, 
it was telling me about, you know, Monroeville. But it's it's a small town. Like if you blink, you'll be done shot through it. You know what I mean? But everybody knew everybody. And I would go down there in the summertime. Mm -hmm. And literally, like if I did something, by the time I made it back to my grandma's house, she already knew what I did. Mm. And, you know, I was being disciplined for it. You know what I mean? But All right. And they kind of knew you because, like, they just knew you. Yeah, they knew. Mm -hmm. my, the family. My family and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So, yeah, it's like both my mother and father grew up in that town. What led for him to come up to the D? Well, my, my father, he was real mischievous and um, what they would call a crazy nigga. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so they had to get him up out of there before, you know, the the lynch mob came for him so he actually like landed in detroit with my um great uncle okay and that's the story of uh so many others uh we think of even coleman young and we think of uh so many others that left alabama from asylum because something went left where a lynch mob was chasing them or the police or something let's put it like this death was at door so then at night you sneaking up to Detroit. Yeah, yeah. In a nutshell, you know, he, he pulled out a knife on somebody that okay. was supposed to be, uh, like you know. higher up or something. Well, no, nah, he was like, you know, mischievous. And he got released from jail and was supposed to have been doing work. And the guy who actually got him to doing the work was kind of mistreating him. Mm. And he got to a point where he was like, all right, I'm not going to take it. And it kind of was about to go real left, but the guy knew my grandmother and kind of like didn't go so hard, you know, kind of let everything uh, de-escalate. Yeah. So, so that's that when he made to... his exit. Yeah. All right. So <laughs> coming up here, where did, uh, what side of town did he move to? Uh, um, where did he set his? Uh... The east side, hmm. the east side Detroiter. Okay, whereabouts? Uh, I would say, hmm, it's probably over in in the Mac and in, in I say, Kirchival area. Okay, something like that. All right, so like I think of that like the southeastern neighborhood a little bit like that, or it could, I guess it could be considered KC and everything. Yeah, um, you 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 got it right. Southeastern. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of my cousins went to southeastern. Okay. All right. And did you have other family? Did he have other family up here already? Or was it one of those things where it was yeah, like, my, oh, I'm going to my, the D? Yeah, my great uncle. That's, okay. that's who was able to take him in. Up. Okay. Yeah. So he had have some place to stay. All right. And now with your journey, I'm guessing, um, and I guess, well, even before that. So your father settles in Detroit. I'm guessing so much work at the time, he's able to find work. But what's his path? Well, no, nah, he came up here and actually, like, they was doing some, like, <laughs> was, I got you. <laughs> they was doing some stuff, you know what I'm saying? They, 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 they landed him his own way. Landed him in jail, mm. you know, like, mm. he actually, the first time he seen me was in a courtroom. Wow. So, yeah, it was like, for the first eight years of my life, you know what I'm saying, he was actually uh, in prison. Your mom, your mom's people, were they already in the D? No. They so all, she came up that way. Yeah, that, she came up with after. him. Okay. All right. So um, so with that, just with your great uncle and everything like that, right there on the east side, figuring out what would happen, making those adjustments. Um, what what house do you remember growing up in? I, I grew up with... Over there? With, no, with my... Uh, Godmother, mm -hmm. who is my auntie, but never married mm -hmm. my great uncle. Okay. But, you know, they was cool, and she took my mother in mm -hmm. while my, my father was gone. And then once my mother got her thing together, then, you know, uh, we moved into, like, a, a two-family flat over on uh, Maxwell. Okay. So still staying east. Yeah, it was still east. All right. All right, what do you remember about that neighborhood with the kids and the time and everything going on? Well, what 
reminds me of like how life is. It's like, you know what I'm saying? It's, it could be short because mm. I got like childhood friends that didn't make it to their teens. Mm. You know what I mean? That just living on that side of town. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, that's one of the things that kind of like, you know, I mean, I remember like, you know, being a child playing outside, things like that. But, you know, one of my best friends, you know what I'm saying, he passed, like, uh, really early. Mm. And that's one of the things that kind of, like, stands out, you know. And what era, like, is this? Is this, like, um, uh, is this early 80s? What what era? Yeah, the 80s. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, 80s kid. What school are you going to? I went to um, Sister Claire Muhammad. Mm. You familiar with Sister Claire Muhammad? Nah, but I'm guessing that's got to be a parochial school. It was over on um, Van Dyke and, uh, let me see, Grasher. It was not too far from Grasher. Okay, Van Dyke, Grasher. Okay, I'm looking at that intersection right now. Yeah, and then it was like this, it's it's like a burgundy building that's over there. That's, mm-hmm. you know, that was the school. Okay, because not far from where the last Depores was, too. Yep. So I remember like when my father, he was released, he came out a Muslim Hmm. and the uh, number one masjid, I remember running around there and they actually like had a school set in there and then they got Sister Claire Muhammad going Hmm. and then I remember going there. Okay. Like up to like maybe the sixth grade until we uh, moved to Highland Park. Okay, so from there to HP and Muslim Nation of Islam. Yeah. Okay. What was uh What was the Nation of Islam like for your family at the time? It was just he came out of jail, renamed everybody, mm-hmm. and pretty much uh started uh imamming, mm. and then he fell out with the community mm-hmm. for whatever reasons. I wasn't, you know, aware enough. To know at the time what. To know about the politics, anything like Mm -hmm. that. But he started a restaurant called Arknartoons. Okay. And Arknartoons was basically a place where uh, people could eat that didn't uh, serve pork. Because it wasn't nothing like that in the community. And uh, and if you ever went to Arknartoons, one of my favorite restaurants for soul food ever. Like like I asked you, I think Arknartoons dressing may be like. The best dressing I've ever had in my life. Like, man, oh, man. And, and barbecue chicken, like, oh, man. Barbecue chicken, dressing, some collard greens. Mm, I wish that place was still around. Yeah, it was some real good eating. Yeah, and then also, like, you walk inside Akhnartoons, and it would be um, it would be the food, and then the brothers would be off to the side always selling, like, uh, DVDs, CDs, yeah, and tapes that was, that of, was uh, Bayon. He's still he's still a minister of information out here. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I, I just seen him at the Harvest Festival. Yep. Yeah, that that brother like put me up on all this stuff that's happening now. I knew back in the nineties. You know what I mean? So it's yeah. like it's it's different when you actually like have those conversations or that information, and then can watch it just play out. So. You know? It's, it's definitely different. So I definitely want to uh, ask this, watching your father get into entrepreneurship. I know where Akhnar Tunes was uh, when I went there on mm. Woodward. What, did it start at that location or did it start somewhere else? No, that was the, the Always location. the location. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. What was it like watching your father build a business? Um, it, it was, like I said, I wasn't aware. I was just a shorty running around. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It was. It was not like, you know, like if I could take the, uh, as I say, if, if we could go back in time and then I could be like talking to myself like, hey, pay attention to this and pay attention yeah. to that. You know, it would have been different. But it was just like, you know, uh, I will say that working in an entrepreneurial environment is not as frustrating for me as it might be for people that's used to. A nine to five. A nine to five. Yeah, it's it's a different type of thing, you know what I mean, where people is used to, okay, I know I'm going to get this and get that. And then, you know, working with 
uh, you know, in a business is, is different. You know, you, you just have to be there. You know what I'm saying? And show up. And sometimes it might not look like it's going to work out that day, but then all of a sudden, boom, it works out that day. You know what I mean? Or just, you just doing really well one day and then slow the rest of the, you know what I mean? It's just all types of variables, but that kind of thing, like, is like, I guess, in me. And even when I did get jobs, I always looked at uh, how the place was ran and, and I take note of that kind of stuff and try to apply it, mm -hmm. you know, to my endeavors. You know what I mean? All right. So, so from there, hip hop, mm -hmm. when do you start connecting to hip hop? When does it start like saying, okay, I'm liking this? Well, Run DMC, you know, um, I, I was a fan of Run DMC. I remember, uh, I believe it was Rockbox. Mm -hmm. I had seen that like on one of those uh, video shows that they show like at night, like after hours or whatever. But mm -hmm. I think I was like in in between sleep a, a sleep state or whatever. I, I thought I was dreaming it, and then all of a sudden, years later, well maybe a couple years later, I see the video. And it's like that's what that's I what had you seen. Saw. Yeah, you know what I mean. But um, the movie. Uh, Beach Street, mm -hmm. you know, I started off uh, breakdancing. I really, you know what I'm saying, enjoy breakdancing. We used to do the cardboard stuff, and mm -hmm. it was like, you know, uh, a couple of kids in the neighborhood over there uh, by the restaurant um, would jam, and we would all get down, and we would, like, stop the bus sometimes. Like, people were actually, like, the bus driver would stop, you know what I'm saying, and, and, and just let a, people watch us, mm. you know what I'm saying, like we was, you know, really having a good time and doing our thing. So it was, you know, it was cool. I started off like that, breaking. So so from breaking, when do you get into rapping yourself? Well, I believe that I was influenced by one of my father's um, entre uh What's the what's the word? Um, um, he he decided to get into music hmm. with an uh, artist. Mm -hmm. Where it was a lady who had actually wrote a couple of songs, and he liked the songs. And he had uh, maybe you can help me with the guy's name. I, I, it escapes me right now, but it was a keyboard player mm -hmm. for the um, Dramatics. Hmm. Key player for the dramatics. Let me think. Keyboard player, yeah. He, he was yeah. uh he was in, into their production. Man, I feel like calling Butch now, nah, Los's fathers. Because <laughs> I know Butch would know. Yeah, he mm -hmm. probably know who he is. And mm -hmm. then um the thing is is George Clinton told him mm -hmm. that this hip hop thing is gonna be huge and you need to, you know, get into it. So that's interesting. So your father like just kinda from the network did did he did he meet these people from the restaurant or like how did he meet the artists probably so mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying as far as the lady i know she used to come into the restaurant okay um the keyboard player from the dramatics uh can't remember his name yeah my, yeah my bad um mm -hmm. and he the keyboard player is is who talked uh well him and george clinton was talking so when my father came and was like i got this uh, lady and she wrote these songs he was like okay you know let's do it so during that process i got to hang out with the lady's son and you know he would pretty much treat me like little bro mm. you know what i'm saying because it was for, for for a while at least eight years of my life i was the only child mm -hmm. and then i eventually had a, a, a another brother mm -hmm. um but that's such a gap that it's yeah, like, it's like an eight, it's yeah. like really an eight year gap. Mm -hmm. But um, you like uncle brother, <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah, it was just literally because I got two other younger brothers, so I got three brothers, and literally my son and my youngest brother, my youngest two brothers, they all the same age. Man, yep, there you go. <laughs> but you know, we was uh, hanging out. And, you know, he would take me to all these places. So, you know, 
this is what they tell me. Like, you know, we was always together and he would be playing with me and everything like that. And mm-hmm. I guess that's what influenced me to uh, rap. Okay, because he would rap, I'm guessing. Yeah, he would be doing his thing. And, um, you know, my father was playing the songs. Uh, you know, I got to know the songs. But, you know, just that whole interaction and just being around that. Okay. And then you were in the studio at an early age, too, then, I'm guessing. Yeah, but. Well, like, you were there. You weren't you know performing. What? You know what? You now, that, now, now I think about it, though, I can't um, skip this part because. Mm-hmm. Next door to the restaurant, it was a family, and me and the family, it's like, it was two brothers and a sister, and we would play, you know what I'm saying, as shorties or whatever, and I started liking their sister. And I'm guessing that's the breakdancing crew, too, kind of. No, nah, they wasn't the breakdancing. They wasn't breakdancing with you, uh-uh. but they was right there. Yeah, they was cool, um, but uh, Tasha was her name, and we actually put out a record our first record with well no that wasn't our first record but our our first independent release as far as like um what we did Mm -hmm. p groove and sleepy d uh featuring tasha t and she actually taught me how to rap interesting yeah interesting see there you go the origins of detroit hip-hop women in detroit hip-hop in the right. origins yeah. all right yeah. so tasha t taking some credit she like i was showing you how to say a bar p groove yeah yeah she she taught me how to rap okay and um i was like you know into uh making songs and things like that and i decided to uh you know try to make tapes so i would like beat on cans and stuff like that with my cassette recorder and i would record them and uh play it back and then make another track you know what i'm saying i would just be overdubbing making beats and stuff and then my father was telling me he was like oh well you know um you need a, a keyboard you know so he went out and got me a keyboard and stuff like that and then um yeah i guess from there you know it just kind of snowballed i went from that keyboard to a drum machine and from that drum machine next thing i know uh you know i'm going to the studio and i'm working with other drum machines what how old are you at the time i'm literally like 11 or 12 wow okay so you're not even in high school yet no no it was like it was like my Junior high friends, um, I had a group with them mm-hmm. that uh, we was called the team, mm-hmm. the team posse. And um, we was like. Uh, Guessing y'all like crisscross before crisscross even existed. Yeah, we was we was doing it. We was doing it like that. But um, it was it was uh, two DJs. And me and my partner, uh, Raymond, mm-hmm. uh, R.I.P., mm-hmm. boy, Raymond Cato, um, we, we and uh, R.I.P. Chris Mays, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? I, he was one of the DJs. But we was, uh, we was doing our thing, and, and, and we were going to the studio. Uh, are you familiar with Roz Kente? Mm-hmm. That was Most like. Definitely. That was like. Ain't no prisoners posse. Yeah, that was the the first studio that I went to in Highland Park because we had moved to Highland Park, mm. and um, Roz Kente was the first studio that we actually recorded in, and he had the real the reels, and he showed us how to, uh, you know, just track. Okay, you know what I'm saying? Learning about that stuff. All right, so so that's like middle. Where do you go for high school? I went to Highland Park. You went to HP, so you HP. Throughout, okay. Did yeah. you go to, and you went, I'm guessing, to the Highland Park High School when it was remodeled and rebuilt and everything? Yeah, the prison. <laughs> yeah, I was up in there. Okay. I, I, I went to uh, Ford Middle mm-hmm. School. Okay. All right, what was uh, what was HP like when you was there with a the polar bear? HP was cool, you know what I mean? It was like, um, I didn't really much have school spirit, mm-hmm. you know, because... 
I was really deep into the music by then. At that point, because I mean, since middle school, carrying on, did did the people at in school kind of know that you were deep into the music? Yeah, a couple of people did. You know, like um, that's where I met DJ Butter. Mm. Uh, that's where I met uh, Super MC. Mm-hmm. Um, I met Chaos. And, uh, from Chaos and Maestro. Yeah. And Chaos actually um, told me about sampling. Mm. He was like, you need to get a sampler, mm-hmm. you know, and stuff like that. So it was like, instead of doing schoolwork, I was in school with manual, rolling manuals, trying to figure out how this stuff worked. You know what I mean? Okay. So during that time, are you performing? Are you just in the studio? What's happening just on the hip hop scene? Well, I mean, we perform like at the school functions and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I DJed a couple of school events. You know, I learned how to DJ. Um, so you picking up like each element of hip hop? Yeah, but I was always like artistic, so I would I would draw all the time. But as far as like the dancing. The uh, rapping, the beat making, and the DJing. The DJing came, and that really like elevated my production. I mm-hmm. think that DJs make the best producers. Well, you hearing things differently and knowing how people respond to them naturally. Yeah. So you know, it's one of those things where like, even as I produce music, I will get with musicians and do. I would get with musicians and they would, uh, you know, maybe just play, but they wouldn't know where the moment is. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's like you got to let a musician be a musician and they got to get it out. And then I identify that spot like, you know, okay, that right Mm -hmm. there, what you did there, that can rock. You know what I'm saying? That's, That's that sweet spot. And you can get like, you know, four, five minutes, you know what I'm saying, out of that. You know what I mean? But it's like they can't identify. They go to the moon and back, and they, they shoot over to Jupiter and come back. You know what I'm saying? And you know, it's just it's awesome. You know what I mean? I so, admire it. So in, in the world of funk, I'm going to give that to people that follow it like how I love it because I love funk. I mean, hip-hop, my favorite art form, is so poured into funk. So I think you're going to be able to echo this, and you may be able to share about it too because it's one of the most sampled artist in hip-hop is always james brown yeah so in james brown you got the james brown work <clears throat> then you got past the peas with the jb's so what the jb's did the backing band for james brown which changed over often but when they released the album you have like the play of like it playing on and everything whereas like with the james brown you get like just that whole feel hence like on the one so like that playing on as you talk about i think you really get a great example of what that is when the jbs are just that's a good way way to look at that because you know james brown understood that you know uh less is more yeah and that's a producer you know, versus you know, saying an artist or you know, just just a musician, just you know, having expression. Yeah, yeah like past the peas is amazing, mm. but it's nothing like Sex Machine. Yeah, you yeah. Know, mm. People that know the catalog of James Brown, and if you don't know the catalog of James Brown, then you should almost pause this and go reference both those songs, and then come back to this. <laughs> right, right. All right. So yeah, that's a great example. So it, in the mix of um, the music now and and that carrying on, what was the idea like at the time? Hip hop is is growing into something, and then just being in hip hop from Detroit, um, you weren't thinking like we got to go to New York or we got to go to L.A. or what? What was the thought process as far as like what you want to do with music? It was just having fun, mm. just experimenting, and just creating you know it wasn't really like ever a competitive thing Mm -hmm. um i think that maybe i would probably be uh, a little more um known if i looked at it from the competitive Mm -hmm. side of it but it's always been like if it ain't fun i would i didn't want to do it okay so as you 
as you stay active in this as time goes on, um, and now we're I guess getting to inner C coming about. So when do you when does inner C come together and get ready to release that first project? Well, that was like you know um, shortly after our uh, we me and my partner that I was telling you I met in high school we had put out a project with Tasha T, mm -hmm. and that record actually did you know pretty good in the city, mm -hmm. and then we met Dez. And then um, we decided to, you know, make the group. So uh, I would say like 90, 91. Yeah. Around that time was when we uh, released like our first project. And that was a, a 12 inch. And it had a uh, production from um, Amp Fiddler and Buzz Fiddler. R.I.P. Both of those brothers. Yeah. And um, on the flip side of that, we had uh, Jay Dilla. How did you meet Amp? Uh, I met Dilla. How did I meet Dilla? Well, no, Amp, not Dilla. How did you meet Amp? Oh, well, Amp. Amp I, I believe I met Amp. Um. Uh, with Dilla. Okay. All collectively. Yeah, because we was just getting into the MPC. Mm -hmm. And he had one. And which which model of the MPC is this? It was the 60. Okay. Yeah. And we was learning how to use it. Mm -hmm. So that was just like, you know, one of those, uh, you know, I didn't think of it now, but he was like a, a music camp, really. You know what I mean? And he just let us just mess around in the studio mm. and um he'd be upstairs doing whatever and we'd just be down in the basement for hours and sometimes I would go uh with James and then other times it was like I started popping up solo. Yeah, solo and 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 you know learning how to use the machine myself. And and let me say this. Um Amp, rest in peace. I think Amp may be like one of the coolest people I've ever met in my life. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like with Fashion Fly and just even like knowing the time and the saying something, his performance, like real meticulous, but just always cool, but very creative. Was he like that when you met him then, like in process of growth? Because at the time. Yeah, he always, he always been cool. You uh -huh. know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Always been cool. And uh, he let me actually mix like a, a couple of his records, because by the time I had, you know, uh, got to that point where, you know, um, I was working with him, I had been in, like, you know, several studios and was learning how to mix and things like that. And that's another one of my loves. I love to engineer music. I like taking a recording and make it sound like a record, you know. How, how did you learn that and how did you develop that skill just being at the studio and sitting behind the board and just picking it up just soaking it up with the different engineers and this is going back to Roz Kente on yeah Roz getting Kente to uh what's the lady who wrote my Sharia Moore Sylvia uh, Sylvia Moore yeah uh her engineer Carlos um I worked with him um ICP's producers, uh, uh, Mike Clark, um, out in Ferndale. He used to have a studio called the Temper Mill. Yeah. Um, that's where I met Jack Frost out there when he was working on his project. Okay. The, um, that song, House That Jack Built, Mike mm -hmm. actually uh, produced that. And um, I was, you know, out there hanging out, learning just, you know, everything about recording. You ever work with, because um, going to HP, did you ever go, and knowing Chaos, did you ever work with Maestro? Um, I worked with them, and I was in a, one of their videos. That was that was about it. But they had pretty much, you know, had their whole thing. Their whole crew with, with Butch and everybody in that uh, world one. <laughs> yeah, so all that was coming together. And, you know, um they pretty much had they they thing solid, but he was putting me up on 
game, you know what I'm saying, as far as like equipment and stuff like that. Okay. So as you're watching this whole thing kind of come together, um, after high school, where, where are the spots that you perform in? Because that was the one thing that definitely stood out a whole lot. You mentioned the Rhythm Kitchen and definitely Hip Hop Shop. You mentioned that. Where was, where were the MCs at? Do you remember like some of those initial spots performing and people taking to it? Um, yeah, fifteen, fifteen. Mm-hmm. That was a place. Uh, it was another place. Um, like my, maybe up the street from fifteen, fifteen. Uh, they had a cafe called Pore Me mm-hmm. Cafe. It was kind of like a a coffee spot. Coffee house. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, that was a good place. Uh. Then um, it was a spot in uh, Hamtramck after uh, after uh, the, the hip hop shop kind of um, faded. It was called the Lush Lounge, mm-hmm. and a lot of cats was performing up there. Um, and then you know wherever we would like, you know, what I'm saying just put shows on. Okay, mm-hmm. so. So, like, I guess that crew, the inner C, what was it like? Um, and how long were you all like performing? And what was it like watching? I'm guessing as you all start a hip hop circle develop, and then definitely that relationship with Dilla, um, and watching Slum and and the Almighty Dreadnoughts come to life, and uh, yeah, shout out to Dreadnoughts and so many other crews. Um. Well, I mean, it it was kind of like one of those things where we was like one of the, the recording. We we was like the people that I guess that folks looked at and said, oh, they did it themselves. Hmm. You know what I'm saying? Because that goes back to the entrepreneurial side. From your father even knowing. Right. And him having the capital to be like, oh, this is what you want to do? All right. Well, let's. this is how you do it. You go. Because he had been working with the artist previously. So he was like, I, you know what I'm saying? Get y'all in the studio. Uh, once you get a, uh, some songs recorded, then we're going to go down to Disc Makers, go to Ohio. We're going to get them pressed up. You know what I'm saying? We're going to come back and then, you know, you're going to start distributing them. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And that was kind of like our end of it where we was putting out our own product. You know, everything that's been released has been independent. So were you working the deals for co-signment? Were you selling the records? We How was, did you work? We that? was doing consignment. Uh, we was doing wholesale, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, just putting the stuff all in the stores everywhere. And that was the crew itself. So you all were, so for people that know co-signment was when you have records, you would like, like um, you would take like, let's say 20 records and you would leave the records there and the co-signment would be that you come back, check the inventory, and it's like, okay, it's 10 left, so give me the money off of the yeah. 10 that's sold. And that's checking the inventory, going back and forth. Usually this is like what a lot of the record company industry would be doing itself, but working that would be independently, you would have to do it yourself. So you all were mm-hmm. doing that as the artist at the time, which yep. is for show independent. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, people were seeing that. And um, I think that we actually were the ones that started people making serious radio intros for like shows and things like that. Like it was always something fun and goofy. But when we came, we did something like this could have been a song. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And it's like uh, we had did one for Be Love. We did... uh, what else we did we did we did like uh mark the sparks mark the sparks um he had he had uh one that i did um the track for and, and super mc rapped over it mm-hmm. uh I, that track was was banging you know what i mean but it's just the fact that when we did that i noticed like a lot of other radio uh shows was getting like you know really into what they was doing as far as not just making some gimmicky of funny you know what i'm saying or kind of 
okay. They was really like, you know, going hard. So I, I think that we was the first ones that actually did that um, for, okay. the, for the city. You know what I mean? For sure, for sure. And, and I want to speak to this too, because, you know, he's been a guest on the show. Um, he's somebody that I've had a hell of a relationship and this ain't necessarily the form, but you spoke to it, but I want to address this directly just so people know. And it was Lord knows what online, the tragedy that happened with super MC. Um, it, it, it was very tragic and it'll be another time that I think that I want to unpack and fully address that, you know, but, uh, as far as the it's artistry awful. that he put into hip hop, um, you know, whether infamous or famous or whatever, his legacy in it is just so connected to a lot in Detroit. Definitely Highland Park hip hop. Um, uh, well, I, I just want to speak. I yeah, I want to. I want to say that you know, mental health is is definitely you know we always talk about it, but you know that was kind of like our our wake up call. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying in the community. Yeah, that you know people could be looking okay on the surface. But, you know, like like how they say those ducks be paddling like crazy. You yeah. know what I'm saying? And it was a, a awful thing that happened, you know what I'm saying, all all the way around, you know. Yeah, most most definitely. And um I, I'm glad that um I'm glad a lot of the organizing that Kalima's been doing and has for a while and Nikki D uh around healing in our community for sisters in need of that is there and very active um so i just want to stop there for a moment to honor and then now we get back to more of the some of the discussions of this creativity and you you move more in the art because i don't even know if you remember we met years ago but i've always known more so from the production and studio and engineering and somebody right. in sound that's what it was always said that mm -hmm. studio sound P Groove is one of those people. When did like you start getting this label as a guy that pieces together the music and engineering so much? Um, well, I didn't know that I was an actual production engineer. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But it's like, I guess it's just, you know, one of the things that I, I grew into as far as just like learning what it was and having access to the technology and understanding the technology. Like, you know, I literally came into the game at the end of Real to Reels and was introduced to ADATS and from ADATS into hard disk recording. So Cakewalk, um, all that stuff, you know, MIDI, you know, all of this stuff was like stuff that I was um, learning as it was coming out and I had access to it early. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So uh, once I stopped going to studios and figured out, like, oh, I could do this in my basement, you know, and we started doing a lot of stuff like that. Like once I got my own MPC and, you know, like I said, I got a, a sampler, you know, and I started doing like, you know, a lot of uh, experimenting at the house because, it's very back in the day, you know, going to the studio was like expensive. Yeah, it? it was really expensive. I mean, just to pay for the the stuff to record on, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? That was like hundreds of dollars. Yeah. Right. And then, you know, you end up booking, you know what I'm saying? A, a couple 10 hour blocks, you know what I'm saying? You coming out some money. And, and also, so people kind of get an understanding of it, it's hard to think about it, especially if you're making music now. And I mean, really, you may just be able to yeah, this out and make a technology whole technology is wonderful, a whole right? everything. But um, at that time in the '80s, '90s, studios were way more set up for bands to come record, especially like the best studios. And I went to the disc recording school myself, so mm -hmm. like people would be like, "Oh, I'm in Studio A." And Studio A is set up for like, I mean, you got a band or you just rap it. So like it wasn't a lot of like music production for hip hop starts developing at the pace of hip hop itself being an industry that like what Heavy D said, it was like early on you had to present that you were a good rapper and that rap was something that would be around and worth listening to. Right. So, like, the production of it and the techniques of it 
it's coming to life as we're watching it live from the 80s to the 90s and that's like i think the 90s in the early 2000s is really the cornerstone of what hip hop production really starts getting pieces but before that you're taking instruments and recording devices that were really designed for for lack of a better term Whitney Houston and Mariah Carey but you rapping on it whereas now so much is so hip hop slanted it is so different now so yeah. learning how to do this for rap is so different even like an MPC 2000 one of the devices that I got mm. I got that for sampling and now if you get an MPC the whole concept right now like an MPC 1000 that can connect to a computer and everything it's it's set up for you to make hip hop this is not <laughs> what, yeah. what I think a lot of that equipment was at the time no, you needed somebody like you to come to the studio with you to know alright how are we going to do this and truncate so like you get a sample and you you're like oh I like that part of the Isley Brothers song you have to know like when to start it when to stop it how to loop it how to loop it and play it and I think one of the interesting things with Dilla especially was like he would play back the samples on different pads of it and everything as opposed to like quantization and like getting things to sync all the same, which creates different rhythms in the music. But as much as I'm saying that's a Dilla style, that's like almost like a Detroit hip hop style. Well, actually, what's interesting about that is, you know, his signature drum pattern. And this yeah. is I found this out. Uh, not too long ago, because I was talking about this with um, uh, my boy Rich, and um, his his style uh, of that drumming that came from uh, my partner uh, Jazilla. Mm. And see, Jazilla, and this is this is like how creativity is like you know what i'm oh. saying it just it just happens and you never know you just it just it just happens but anyway we was doing a, a commercial mm -hmm. for the restaurant mm. over amp house wow yeah and it was this song that you know we was rapping about macaroni and cheese and all the right. good stuff like that right mm -hmm. but my partner uh his drum pedal his his kick drum pedal it was something was wrong with it where he had to loosen it to where either he had hit it and it had come early or it had come late. But either way, he had to play it in a way. And it was like the rhythm was that off on rhythm. Mm -hmm. And that's where, you know what I'm saying, Dylan picked up that feel. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> that's something. Yeah, from a broken, you know what I'm saying, kick pedal. Ain't that something? Yeah. So shout out Jazilla. All right. So like this is like that feel of you being in the studio, knowing all of this stuff, and learning how to mic the drums, how you want it for hip hop, and, and and get that sound. And you also did it with hardware and software. Meaning, like at one point in time, all of that stuff in your computer that you're doing music with, yeah, it was analog, right? It was all analog hardware. Like you would walk into a studio, and it would be. It almost looked like, uh, it's hard to even explain. It would look like a lot of stacked up digital things for like different devices for different effects. And they would be bringing in microphone cords. Yeah, you have, you have rack phones. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have, you have uh, whole, whole racks and stuff like that. I remember uh, when, when I was mixing a uh, Fat Cat uh, first record, a uh, 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 a, a day with the homies and um what was that other record uh but it was it was um it was it was the first one on payday mm -hmm. remember uh that label um mm -hmm. uh, what, was, what was that record though <sighs> it escapes me but yeah um uh, we was telling um the engineers to bring us all the all the uh you know what I'm saying? All the racks. Racks in and stuff. We was going through all this stuff like that and just going crazy. And um yeah, I, I um knew how to do all that stuff. So it was like, yeah, it was pretty dope. You know what I'm saying? Just that was just a moment where everything kinda like came together, you know what I'm saying? 
so during this time uh in this just field of hip hop and what you're enjoying and, and having that appreciation um what's your what's your take on the industry kind of coming together because also during this time this as this continues like from the 90s to 2000s clearly the elephant in the room for hip hop for Detroit hip hop becomes Eminem and mm. D12 and what happens with Proof and all of them and Rusty yeah. P Where's your state of mind now as more attention is coming to this Detroit hip hop scene? Uh, just steady, you know what I'm saying? Um, releasing music, you know. Um, we had got with uh, Submerge. You familiar with Submerge? So mm -hmm. Mike Banks, um, him and Jeff Mills, they actually was key in my first actual record. Hmm. being released it was sleepy d mm -hmm. rapping over a track and it was called drop the funk and um i say in 99 you know uh after you know uh mike and jeff went separate ways you know mike um and jeff they started underground resistance and then jeff went on head overseas and he blew up and now he's you know jeff yeah. mills you know what yeah. i mean and then um Mike Banks is, you know, uh, still like the leader of the resistance, you know, underground resistance. We came back together in 99. Like this is uh, from 89, like to 99. Uh, like, you know, uh, I had needed a distrib distribution, you know, and he was like, yeah, well, you know, come on and, you know, put some stuff together and I, I've distributed for you, you know? So it was more like I was still just, you know, working on a lot of the having, production, and having just fun. And yeah. 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 And just, just, you know, it wasn't really a, a one of those things. It was like cool to see that, you know, the light was being shined on Detroit. Like, like even right now, you know what I'm saying? It's a different emergence of it. Mm. Yeah, and I mean, I love it. You know, I love the fact that, okay, Detroit is like the home of hip-hop now. Mm -hmm. That being, you know, whatever that is now because it's yeah. crazy how, you know, the uh, the game is and they didn't snatch all the ways of really making money out of it, you know. Yeah. But still, if you got a passion for it and you got a love for it, you can make, you know, a living. So, so with that, as we get closer to a close and just steal so many other stories, is there anything you want to share in your hip hop story before I ask about right now what you're working on? Um, I would just say, well, be creative. You know, that's that's the thing. Um, creativity over competition. Okay, I love you know, it. never never compete because as soon as you compete, that's when you lost. So just be who you are, you know, and if you create the way you create, it's bound to be, you know, some people that's going to actually enjoy, enjoy what you do just like, just as much as you enjoy it. Respect. Respect. Mm -hmm. All right. So now what you working on now? Well, I'm working on a, a instrumental project. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm doing a lot of, uh, remixes with, you know, Mike and, um, I got like, uh, some stuff in the works with Aisha, um, uh, and, and Piper, her, uh, new label. Mm -hmm. We found hip hop. Yeah. So, you know, um, uh, besides that, just staying in the studio, you know, um, helping young producers, uh, maybe get get to the road a lot faster without going through a, a lot of hitting a lot of walls, you know, showing them some shortcuts. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Things like that. All right. So now the classic Detroit is different question. Mm -hmm. Your very first car, year making model year. You got it. Uh, I got a, a Jeep Wagoneer. Um, I think it was like, a. 89 okay 
It had the wood grain on it or whatever. Oh, man. What year you get it? I got it in 89. Oh, man. Oh, sh- man. I, I, I'm sure everybody wanted to ride with you. For, well, no, that actually know. was, you know, uh, your your girl, uh, Nikki D. <laughs> um, Chaos and them, they was calling me uh, the, the uh, paper boy. Uh-huh. Because it looked like the, the car you ride around deliver papers. Uh, hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> hilarious not the kind of paper boy who would think hilarious. you know what I'm saying I'm sure everybody wanted a ride I'm sure because it's like just having wheels alright yeah. so uh, you remember the first place you went when you got it no okay alright so now I'm going to ask a second question you're the DJ at the end of the fireworks what were Jefferson you get to play two songs. What songs are you playing? You said the DJ at, at the fireworks? At the end of the fireworks. You get to play two songs. You got Woodward and Jefferson. What songs are you playing? Um, it was, it's a Stevie Wonder song. Uh, I can't remember the name of it, though. That, that sucks. <laughs> Which one? <laughs> it was, it's, it's, it's one that's, that touched me so deep. Hmm. But, uh, you know, you actually made me want to go look for it now so I can listen to it and see if I still get that same feeling. Okay. That one and um, Keep On Moving by Soul to Soul. All right. And last question. You could rename Woodward after one Detroiter. Who would it be and why? Uh, Amp. Hmm. Why? Because, you know, um, Woodward is so important, and it's like a, a landmark, and it's kind of like one of those places where if you get lost, if, if you find Woodward, you can actually, like, maybe find your way back home. You got that right. So, yeah, yeah that's kind of like what I think, and, and now I'm reflecting on it, what AMP was to a lot of us. Yeah, man. Rest in peace. Love AMP always. Yeah. Be Groove. Thank you so much for coming in studio. Thank you, Mr. Frazier. Peace and prosperity. Detroit is Different is where you get information, artistry, history, music, and even comedy. Detroit is Different, a home for the culture of Detroit. Visit online at DetroitIsDifferent.com today.